Posterior approach to the radial diaphysis. Thompson approach. Kamal Gakas MD, Baskin University Alanya Research and Practice Center. This video was produced from the book source, European Surgical Orthopedics and Traumatology. The E. Fort Textbook. Citation. Bentley, G., 2014. European Surgical Orthopedics and Traumatology The Effort Textbook. Spring. This approach is less often used than the anterior approach. Its main advantage is control of the deep, motor, branch of the radial nerve, posterior interosseous nerve. Surgical anatomy. Three groups of muscles must be distinguished. Figure. The first group inserts on the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus and comprises the brachioradialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and extensor carpi radialis brevis muscles. The second group has a common tendon attached to the lateral epicondyle. It is composed of the superficial extensor muscles, which run longitudinally to the wrist. These muscles are the extensor digitorum communis, extensor carpi ulnaris, extensor digiti minimi, and anconius. The third group consists of the muscles running to the thumb, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, and abductor pollicis brevis, supinator muscle, and extensor indices. The proximal insertion of these muscles is located deep to the first two muscle groups, and the three muscles for the thumb have a characteristic orientation, coursing obliquely toward the radius from proximal to distal. The main structures at risk for injury by the posterior approach are the deep, motor, branch of the radial nerve, also known as the posterior interosseous nerve, which passes between the two heads of the supinator muscle, and the posterior interosseous artery arising from the ulnar artery and passing through the interosseous space to reach the posterior forearm compartment. Skin incision. The landmarks are the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and Lister's tubercle. The incision is located on the line linking these two landmarks. Figure. Superficial dissection plan. The superficial fascia of the forearm is incised in line with the skin incision. Two muscles must be identified, the extensor carpi radialis brevis and extensor digitorum communis. The interval between these muscles serves as a way of passage and must be enlarged by retracting both muscles. This interval is easier to enlarge distally where the tendons are clearly individualized than proximally where the muscles are frequently merged and share a common aponeurosis. Deep dissection plane. Through this interval, the following muscles cover the radial shaft from proximal to distal. The supinator, pronator teres, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and extensor pollicis longus, figures. The posterior, motor, branch of the radial nerve is found between the superficial and deep layers of the supinator muscle. Once this nerve is dissected, it can be carefully retracted. Then, the radial shaft can be exposed by detaching the deep layer of the supinator muscle, dividing the pronator teres, and performing on block proximal or distal retraction of the group composed of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. At the level where the posterior branch of the radial nerve runs around the radius, it is very important to visualize the nerve as otherwise it might become trapped under the plate. Closure If the pronator teres was divided, it must be sutured. The skin is closed directly after insertion of a suction drain. As with the anterior approach, the posterior approach must be closed only after deflating the tourniquet and closing the ulnar incision to minimize the risk of dorsal compartment syndrome. 